I'm going out um, Tuesday morning, April 2nd. Lucky, you know, we made it through yesterday. I know. April Fool's Day. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, we have uh, General Wolf, Winsky, Lipsky. with us uh, from the House. And <clears throat> um, I thought we would uh, look through the timber as the bill. And uh, so before we start, uh, Jeff, you will introduce ourselves and, and uh, don't want you to forget us, you know, our names. Uh, so, Brian Collum, more representing the Rutland District. Irene Robertson in North Dakota, Fairfax. Brian Campy in Bennington County. Richie Westman is uh, working on some appropriation thing. He's got to do I'm Bobby Starr and <clears throat> want to certainly uh, welcome you to the committee. Uh, this uh, bill, uh, when it got over here, originally went to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, the chair of that committee <clears throat> felt their plate was pretty full and that a lot of this timber truck has uh, that happened uh, on woodland or ag land, and, and a lot of farmers own and lumber people on this woodland. <clears throat> so he asked us to take a look at it, uh, review it, and and uh, you know work on it. So this is our first attempt. Well, thank you. Uh... Chairman Starr, and thank you, committee, and thank you, the, uh, your administrator, for the invitation. For the record, my name is Jed Lipsky. I'm the representative from the Lamoya 1 district, which is Stowe. And for background, uh, I've been a professional independent logging contractor for over 50 years. I am uh, a certified leap a logger. I am uh, a certified master logger certified by the Trust Conserve Northeast Forest. I am a member of the Vermont Forest Products Association. I'm a board member of the uh, I'm a member of the um, New, newly expanded professional logging contractors at the Northeast. I'm a met, uh, and I am a board member of the Northeastern Loggers Association, which is actually headquartered in uh, Old Forge, New York, but includes Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, and all of the New England states and New Jersey. So mm -hmm. I've been active not just professionally, but as an advocate for. Uh, active forest management and so that's some of my background uh, but the bill before you which we refer to as uh h614 uh is an act uh, to protect victims landowners who have experienced uh what's now called land fraud or timber trespass. There's a difference between unintentional uh, timber trespass where there may be poorly marked uh, boundary line and a contractor might have cut over boundary, not intentionally confronts their mistake and uh, negotiates a, a appropriate reparation with either the forest or representing a landowner or landowner. But this is this is targeting a whole nother class of crime that uh, that's actually done a great deal of damage, not moderate damage to landowners both emotionally and uh, financially. And I could give you an example of this or a few if you'd like and Bobby, if, if you just guide me, I can walk you through the bill. I can talk about uh, some examples of why I think this is important, and I'll take guidance from you. 
If you want five minutes, three minutes, or 15 minutes, I'm happy to well, try to make uh, our case. We, we need to understand the severity of it. And the difference is like intentional and non-intentional or what you folks have found uh, over on the health side. Uh, well, though then we can report, you know, the finding of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a, a background to give you sort of a picture of what it's like to be a victim. Yeah. And uh, also how frustrating it's been. Uh, and I, more background, I think, you know, transparency and accuracy matters in, in everything. But, but uh, I was approached, uh, I was actually at a meeting with the professional law contractors in the Northeast, and we zoomed into a meeting with the speaker. And I was in a pickup truck, and uh, there were with the executive director of the Northeast Forest Products, the Northeast Logger Association was there, and also a logger from Orange County was a former deputy commissioner of forest products recreation. And when we reached out to the speaker and her staff, she allowed, well, what are you doing about timber trespass? And that may have been in September when this conversation came. And after the Zoom ended, uh, a, a conversation ensued. Not that none of us didn't know what timber trespass was, but the crisis that had been brought to the speaker. And that was a representative from, uh, I, I think it was Marshfield, uh, Plainfield, Mah uh, Rep Mahali, and we immediately uh, reached out to him and wanted to get an understanding of why this was in the forefront. In fact, uh, he talked about some experiences he's had from frustrated constituents. And in one case, there's a constituent for six and a half years now had his land uh, logged in violation of a verbal agreement, never received payment for any of the timber taken off his land. And there was an, he had two abutters, one on each side of him. Uh, they all agreed that this would be a good thing and a source of revenue. The first property owner who was harvested on uh, received payment for maybe 10, one or two loads, and the next loads were never paid for. This other complainant had at least 10 loads, long trailer loads, taken off his property, never received a penny. And the uh, third butter experienced the same thing. So they went to the local police. You know, this is, out of our jurisdiction. They went to FPR. We do not have the uh, staff or to handle this. So they went to the state police, same story. They went to the state's attorney, same story. And if I told you what it's like, and this, these are all older folks, have their, uh, have been managing this part of their survival, fixed incomes, some ex-veterans. But what if it was another example of someone up in your neck of the woods, uh, Jeremy Starr, uh, in Orleans County, who was an out-of-state owner, came back, found his land stripped, went to the local authorities, mm -hmm. uh, and he said, I think I know who it is. He's a neighbor. And uh, the local authorities asked the neighbor, did you cut this person's trees? Yes, I did. Did you have permission to go on his land and cut his trees? No, I didn't. Uh, did you ever remunerate or pay 
is someone refer to any of the wood that you took? No, I did not. So full confessions and zero action from any law enforcement. And there, there were other, I'll give you one other example, just so you can understand the, the sort of viciousness of the, these kind of actions. There was another out-of-state owner who had their land in current use, uh, use appraisal uh, assessment program, came and found that uh, a portion way beyond what was approved was uh, harvested as well. Uh, and these people had the, uh, the funds to hire an attorney, take the perpetrator to court, and uh, found a favorable result in the court, which not only charged the, uh, the timber thief, you know, a triple stumpage value, you know, uh, and to this day, that person has recovered not one U.S. dollar. Why? Why does this happen? And and these aren't the only three examples in Vermont. We took hours, days of testimony on this uh, in our committee, and there is a theme. And as I stated, some of my. Uh, resume and history as a professional logging contractor. I want to state for the record that most logging contractors that I've spent my life working with are have great integrity, great responsibility for managing the resource and the environment and water quality and wildlife habitat and songbird habitat and outdoor recreation. We have a lot on our shoulders today and in order to survive and tough uh, climate, resiliency times, as well as economic times. It's a lot of responsibility. But as an organization or as a community, both the uh, Vermont Forest Products Association and the professional logging contracts for the North East all supported this bill. <clears throat> there, there is a scourge, there are criminals all over the world, or credit cards get hacked, or everything. It's there's no limit. But this is something that's been going on far too long. Uh, and I just want to point out, we had uh, state police, we had FPR, and we finally had the attorney general's office and the state, you know, district attorney office, state's attorneys, could all come in and testify. And they all believe that uh, the wording of this bill, land fraud, sounds like a weird concept, but in this case, it clearly ties uh, an additional area of fraud to intentional timber trespass <laughs> and gives the responsibility for the attorney's general office to prosecute. So that the Office of the Attorney General shall consult, I see, with the Department of Forest and Parks. But are you you're actually giving the authority to prosecute right to the broad division of the Attorney General's office? Yes. So with that background, which was not brief, I could walk you through the the bill is sort of a summary section by section, if you would like. This is, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that Rep. Mahali, who I referenced earlier, it, it came into the room and frankly credit him with the fact his advocacy to stop this scourge. Uh, and the scourge is, is being promulgated by predator criminals. So definitely, they target individuals that are older, absentee, or most vulnerable. Yeah, maybe, Mark, uh, 
Keith, are you limited on your time this yeah. morning? I'm, I'm, I'm okay until I get yanked back into appropriations to vote. Yeah. But I, I don't know when that is. So you think you've got time to sit through this, or do you want to give us a little bit on appropriations bill and go back to committee? Why don't I, why don't I speak briefly before Please. you go last, before you go through the bill yeah, itself? Then, is that okay with representative? It would be my honor. Thank you, Lord. Then you can be excused. Or I can sit here until I get back. It's more fun here. Than that's that. a comfortable <laughs> chair. I don't know if you know. No, I, I actually have not personally said hello to anybody. I recognize the face. Yeah, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Brian, pleasure to meet you. For you, I know. You three are in the same class. Sit down. Uh, oh. I can't be in Bennington County. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm very really so much younger. from not Orleans County. A pleasure. Yeah, welcome. I'm Mark Mahali for the record. Um, I represent Plainfield, Marshfield, and Callis. I got hauled into a meeting of about a half dozen of my constituents and discovered a problem that I mm -hmm. frankly didn't even know existed, mm -hmm. which is rather pervasive predatory fraud against uh, people. They're very careful who they pick. For example, people who have foresters. Because they are, uh, you know, they have land that current in current use, they tend to stay away from them. They pick people. They're very good at it, and they knock on your door and say, "We're in the neighborhood," and it's such a Vermont thing every to trust. And you know, people say, "Can we?" Well, yeah. How about that bunch of trees over there? And they'll say, "Okay," and then they'll go cut them down and stay and cut a lot more, and then say, "Oh, but we'll pay you." And sometimes when people say, get off my property, they they drive them physically and they don't they don't pay them ever. And then they get sometimes, as you know, it takes money to hire a lawyer and go through that. And a lot of people just don't have it. They they sue, and, and as you heard, they're successful. They get a judgment. And not only that, there have been actions against these people over the years where they have fines. Well, when you get fined in Vermont. When you don't pay, it gets turned over to a collection agency. The collection agency sent the nasty letter. These people just don't pay attention for it. They don't pay. They don't. They don't pay. They don't pay their fines. They don't pay their judgments, and it works. And so, uh, the only thing I want to add to what Representative Lipsky said, or at least what I heard he said, this is. I really made an attempt here because of the advice that I got from loggers, wonderful people. I mean, really honorable, great people. I resisted effort Christmas tree this with requirements that loggers register, that they license, that, that you know, things like that. There were there there are various things out there to, to regulate the law of the community plan. I just felt if I could miss bill, why punish all the good actors because of the people that act wrong? And so the bill, the bill is about as narrow as we could make it. I it went through uh House Agriculture and which did spend a lot of time and I, I really praise them. They heard a lot of people talk. We worked, I met with the attorney general and, uh, you know, their office and at their, a lot of this is at their suggestion. Then it went to judiciary, briefly ways to me, but judiciary. I will say in, there was one aspect of the way it came out of the house that I was, you know, not entirely thrilled with. I just want to mention. Um, I believe the only way that we can get to bad actors like this is not by more fines and more. It's not money they just don't pay. It's either jailed or seizing their equipment. I was saying, Mr. Chair, that I don't. I think the best way to get to these bad actors is either by putting them in jail or seizing their equipment. In fact, I think if we did that with one or two, that would. Words get 
The jail time is definitely a possibility under the bill as you have it. There were a few people in judiciary who were uncomfortable with seizure, and they eventually, I think the seizure could be this, but they took it out. The seizure are, they went ahead. If they're kind of operators that we know they are, they probably don't own the equipment either. Right. You know, it's um, either that or they're behind on their payments. So you'd be seizing something that's really not of any value. You're right. And that's why the original provision, we met with the community of people here from the state who work on seizures. The original provided that if the equipment is seized, it can be sold unless someone demonstrates that someone else owns the property and they are not related in any way by corporate form or by family with the defendant. They have to show, and they did not know, nor could they have known by an objective standard, how the equipment was going to be used. And if they can't show that, too bad, they don't get it. And, um, I get it was raised, a, a member of the committee raised exactly your issue and said, well, what about rental? What if they rent the equipment? And we thought that through and realized that if a rental agency uh, really could show that they had no way of knowing, which is a little unlikely, then they would get the equipment back. But they'd never be able to rent it to these people again because their name is on a list, they've been prosecuted and they know. So we felt like, hey, this the problem that actually that was in the committee over seizure was, it's a big thing to see, this is big equipment. Yeah. The AG was saying, I don't know that we would ever do it. And I guess our feeling was, well, try. You know, all you have to do is do it once and then it's a word to get out. But there, there were a number of people on the committee who felt they just don't like seizure generally because they think that the proceeds of seizure go to law enforcement and law enforcement becomes self-motivated. So the way to deal with that, and the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Representative Lalon, was considering that is just to provide that the seizure of this, this kind of, in this situation, goes to the victims and uh, the proceeds of sale. But it was near the end of his the time. It was complicated, yeah. and he just thought another time and left it out. I wish personally we hadn't left it out. But aside from that, I'm thrilled uh, that it's gotten this far, and I'd be happy in the future to answer any questions that you might have, either by email or. <clears throat> well, I think you know. I think you're you're in the right direction. Um, these people, the only thing they really have is time. And if you take the time away from them, they're really not doing well. So, I mean, it's sad to say, but that means put them in jail and take their time away from them. And, and because most of them, I mean, I've had them come over on my property, uh, but caught it really quick. But they don't have two nickels uh, to rub together. Then, I mean, you don't gain money out of them. You know, the only thing you can do is, but if you're, you know, older than I am, and, and maybe uh, the opposite sex that ends up with the property, uh, I mean, my wife wouldn't be down there, uh, you know, looking after things. And, you know, the forester, you can call them and uh, they'll come, but uh, you kind of just to look at a boundary line. But you've got to know they're there cutting too. Is there anything in the bill where a property owner, when they are cutting, has to notify the abiding landowners? That's not in the bill. 
there's protections. There was a concern on the part of a number of the uh, loggers, they really the professional loggers northeast wanted to make sure that you couldn't just inadvertently get caught by logging on a neighbor's a logger and that logging on a neighbor's property because they didn't know where the boundary was. And so what we did is we changed the standard of proof. And really the, the most draconian parts of the bill, there are a few draconian parts deliberately. Specifically, if you had two strikes, that is two fines or judgments that you have not paid. If you have unpaid fines and judgments, at least two, you can't go on logging unless you post a $250,000 bond or you're working for a legit logging outfit that you don't own and your mom doesn't own and your sister doesn't own. And that's... That's fine. in the bill, yeah. Uh, Mark, what does it cost to get a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bond? It's a, it's I think probably north of ten thousand dollars. Okay. So what that we just don't think that's not what's going to happen. But what it does is it means that all these people who have unpaid judgments and unpaid fines, it sweeps them in and says to them, you can't log unless you go work for somebody else. And if you do, it's a crime. So a lot of this was trying to figure out with the AG, how do we tweak things so that it's easier for law enforcement? Mm -hmm. So in the bill, like the, um, if there's a violation, it goes to the attorney general's office, it doesn't go to uh, NPR or it's, the state police or? It's either the AG or state's attorney. Okay. I mean, part of the problem, honestly, in the past has been, I mean, some of this, we're going to have to carry out some education here because when people call up the state's attorneys, very often they, they say, well, of course, they're overwhelmed, but they say, this is a civil matter. Hire your lawyer. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so this is making it very clear. This is a criminal right. matter. Right. It's that. Yeah. And a lot of it. One woman who testified, well, she was testified about, met exactly your description. She's very elderly. It's a woman. They took $200,000 worth of timber off the land, and she paid, She received not a dime. Wow. So yeah. it's, it's, okay. the There's more no people way. you talk to, it's like you. The more people you talk to, the more people say, you know, that happened to my dad, or you know, that happened to me. It's, it's, I think it's actually a little more pervasive than we know. Yeah. The only way to kind of prevent that is on all the land from the river to the road, to the other road, and to the road that way, and then you keep them and help out. But have you, have you ever heard either of you of anybody getting paid at for this cutting practice that, where they just take the wood and run? Not that I know of. No. No one? I, I, did, you, did you hear anything? No. The only judgments that I'm aware of were violations of AMPs where they drop trees uh, into a, a water body and uh, the landowner uh, received heavy fines, but the landowner was never reimbursed. Now, I think that this is an important, uh, there's a notion of salt in the wound. Let's say you have had your timber uh, stolen in violation of contract and you have had maybe for a generation or two your land in the use value appraisal system also known as current use where you uh all of a sudden you find yourself in violation of an approved uh forest plan so your punishment is to have yeah. your your current use uh, removed. So not only did you 
get zero for your resource that you've been counting on, now you lose the tax value saved because you're in violation. And that's what I call it, the salt in the wound. You are, are double uh, pommel by, by these acts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Jed, um, how many generations have to go by before that loss, if you will, is, is sort of back on track? In other words, trees grow at a certain you know, yeah. pace. Is it two, three, four, five generations? I mean, how long does it take to get well, it back to where it was? Let's... There, there are a lot of factors that go into that, but uh, it's it's multiple generations. Yeah. You know, I, particularly hardwood. Yeah, hardwood yeah. and take uh, softwood, 30 years, 25, 30. That's to, to a mature, so, merchantable size, it's, it's longer. And there's another factor. When you went engage in a contract, with a legitimate logger, there are closeout responsibilities. You have to put in infrastructure, water bars, protect soils, other resource, residual stand. Uh, and then you have very clear uh, responsibilities and closeout that the contract's responsible for making sure the main skid roads are open, free of debris, there's no tops near. Uh, waterways or ravines or property lines or any number of, in some cases, and this affects, you know, the value, the summit value the land will receive. They may want some areas chipped or um, so there's not a lot of debris. What the saddest, one of the sadder pieces of this story is not only did you lose your tax status, did you lose your resource, it was left a mess. And when you have acres and acres of tops that are not lobbed, it may take 15 years for them to uh, decompose and be part of the soil. So your woods, you've lost them for recreation, for hiking, for hunting. So the carnage, if you're a victim of this sort of crime, nobody's, the thief did not have any good intentions in mind. So it, it the damage is, say, permanent is not in perpetuity, but it's a half a century to a century and a quarter to get back to this. So, is there anything in the bill, a bill, or did the Ag uh, Committee consider a provision? I don't know how to say this the right way that if the logger brings, in essence, stolen timber to a processor, that processor cannot get paid, or the logger can't get paid until. The I owner of the timber signs off on it? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, if if I I think that Rep Mahali made a clear decision about understands the law, adding uh, land fraud and timber trespass to criminal status, uh, went through the, the seizure and forfeiture yep. pieces, uh, which were a disappointment to us as well, but I could go in depth of why it's complicated. You have the 77,000 pound machine, you have to hire a low boy, you have to store it somewhere, you have to know how to start it, you have to know how to load it, very complicated. But to your point, uh, section eight of the bill as passed by the house, it's called Implementation Semicolon Conditions of Operation, Section 8. It provides the requirement under 13 VSA 3605 that a person convicted of attempt to trespass it goes on about the, the penalties and being on a basically a black. I don't see anything after Section 4. Yeah. We're looking at as passed by the House, and we only have five seconds. Is that possible? Okay. Are you looking at a different version? Well, how about the Attorney General report on timber trespass enforcement? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's section that's four okay. at the bottom of page nine. Okay. Well, that requires, this is important, and that answers your question. Uh, 
requires the Attorney General to submit to the General Assembly a report regarding the current enforcement of timber trespass within the state and potential potential methods of improving enforcement. Okay. Yep. The report shall include one. A summary of the current issues pertaining to enforcement of timber trespass statutes. Two, summary of mechanisms or alternatives used in other states to effectively enforce or prevent timber theft or similar crimes. And three, recommendations for programs, policy changes, staffing, and budget estimates to improve enforcement and prevention, ensure consumer protection, and reduce the illegal harvesting, theft, and transporting of timber in the state, including proposed statutory changes to implement these recommendations. So that gives them uh, approximately one year to get back. And there were, uh, for instance, uh, members of FPR, Forest, Vermont Woodland Association, professional logging contractors of Vermont, along with state's attorneys and attorney general, participate in the development of a report back as to rather than get bogged down and this bill die, because it, you know, for Rep Mahali and frankly for me personally and our committee, our industry, we needed to drive the stake in the ground yes. and give law enforcement tools. Okay. So that's why there will be professionals uh, that will take a deep dive into all possible ways, whether it's trip tickets or track and trace, you know, where there's a paper trail where that particular load from that property on the web, which I expect in the future will help flesh out uh, the effectiveness. Uh, but I do agree with Rep Mahali, when you, when you get with this bill on a blacklist of two strikes of unpaid the judgments or fines, you, you, you are not able to work. And we spoke to law enforcement, but with state police, or you know the backlog of yeah. Uh, on tried cases, we have a very dysfunctional crisis in the judiciary in our state, and they're saying there are murders, there are uh, wounds, rapes, very violent crimes that take a priority. And I'm sorry, folks, but timber theft or land fraud is on the list, but they're not the top of the list. So that's the reality we live in. And that's why it was so important that this bill in this form was uh so you you get on the list. How how does uh, Mrs. So and so find the list? How does how does a person know where to go to find the list? Who's going to do the education of getting the word out there. I, I just would, Mr. Chair, if I might, um, there's some value to be that list, but I don't want to exaggerate it. The value is once you're on the list, no one can rent equipment to you because they either know or should know okay. what's happening, number one. Number two, to get on that list means you can't log anywhere yourself. But in terms of the point you made, my personal view is that no one, none of these victims are going to go look at that list. Some of them don't have internet, much less inclination to use it. So it's it, it's valuable. It should be done, and it has value. But I don't think it will help the individual. The only thing that's going to help the individuals is to get these people out of doing what they're doing. Yeah. And I've you know, I've turned it to a law and order. <laughs> but it's okay. Know, That's I've what made, I am. Yeah. I've made the point that the two organizations in Vermont that are leaders in the forest products and logging industry have both unanimously supported this effort. Nobody wants 
this kind of black mark on their industry that uh, and FPR is aware of it and they you know education whether it's Mont Woodlands magazine the Northern Logger which uh, is published by Northeast Turn Logger Association now there are articles about this it, it, it's not uh, but the education piece is there may be recommendations in this report on timber trespass enforcement and recommendations that will come forth if this becomes small. Yeah, my only suggestion in asking the question was, if I'm a bad actor and I know I'm not gonna get paid until the owner of that timber signs off on it, it might make me hesitate. That's all, but I'm sure you'll consider that. Well, you know, you know, frankly, it's not just the viciousness, but as uh, Rep. Mahali said, these folks are clever. Uh, they might ship these logs to one yard, put them on another truck. Some go to Canada, some go to out of state, and, <laughs> and or forge your signature on the yard. Yeah, and you know. The depth of crime is not uh, shallow. It's we, we, that's a very interesting suggestion. Actually, fairly early on in the drafting, we were kind of attracted by the idea of of, of requiring that the uh, lumber yards, that the saw mills themselves, not do something where they couldn't pay these guys. And we realized we are too small a state. They just go to New Hampshire or Canada. And they already do, and they split the loads up. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought about that. I think it would be great if uh, we were a little bigger, maybe. Of course, self-contained. This whole this whole practice has <clears throat> gone on for ever. Uh, they leave your property with, say, thirty-two logs on the log, get to the mill, and only have twenty-eight. Or fell off someplace. I mean, it's crazy. It it's not it's not good. And oh, uh, thank you. I'm gonna go over to the uh, yeah other committee and see. Well, if we if you, I'm happy to help. If you're, uh, we need more advice. Well, if Linda texts me or emails me. I'll make sure one way or another to get back. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So the Attorney General is going to be the one that would be in charge of, of what you file your complaint to them. What about Forest and Parks? Are they mixed up in this bill? Uh, I won't say regrettably not, but they don't have the capacity, experience. They are not licensed law enforcement. The, the law enforcement agency that possibly had the ability and skill set and power with for fish and wildlife. They do not have a specific training in these uh, violations. So the buck was passed all over the state. All to, and it would have taken setting up a new division. As you know, they're under siege, uh, just trying to do their own uh, good work in the state. So I'm too busy. That way too much to do already. Um, I heard that excuse forever. Um, <laughs> but, they, this... but they're the professionals. Um, you know, every every county, I believe, if not every region, has a force. There's a county force. And, you know, if, if some elderly person has, has been left off in plain direction, I would think that they could almost find time to go in 
and measure the stumpage. I mean, you can tell if a log has been cut in the last few months. Uh, somebody's got to measure the stumpage to know that can verify it, that can give some numbers. The AG doesn't have anybody that, that can do measure stumps. Some of these people don't even have a forester on the payroll. So they can have their own do it. And if they did have their own do it, then it could be questioned that they have a self-interest to exaggerate or to get the thing higher. So I would think you a county forester goes in there non-biased to measure up the stumps and know the footage. So you would have in the value of the product, whether it's hardwood, softwood, maple, birch. <clears throat> Senator, you know, common sense and rational thinking, you know, <laughs> don't necessarily apply here because county foresters, when they are approached, they say, well, this is not our authority. We do not have the time, the expertise. We are not being paid to go down the rabbit hole of inventory uh, and building the case. Um, I've heard this so many times. Professional uh, foresters that actually may be familiar with it find it, well, my time's expensive. Who's going to pay uh, for building this case and going, showing up in court, testifying, getting a judge, getting no resolution. Yep. Coming back, one of these landowners who testified said after five and a half years, he finally got a judgment. The uh, perpetrator didn't show up. Uh, and after the second time of not showing up, he says, well, what do you want me to do? Find them in contempt of court? And the landlord says, yes. Well, he said, if you can do that, it's going to cost you this much for court fees to schedule it. And uh, by the way, five and a half years and multiple court appearances have taken place. It's so the shot. justice is not there. Yeah. And uh, I would do you think the county mm -hmm. forester system might have that capacity it being rational thinking you might but it doesn't it isn't playing with that or so I, would, I was thinking if if a cutter had to be registered you know or a, a person that's in the cutting room had to be registered through the state, They'd be issued a number <clears throat> when they go to sell the law to a buyer. That number would have to be on the slip, that the scale slip or the sales slip. Did you talk about anything like that? We did. And was that bad or? It was. There were so many different options, call out a track and trace or a trip yeah. ticket. Mm -hmm. Many of the mills I bring into, uh, I will go to a box, all up truckers, I truck my own wood generally, fill it out, landowner species, my name, trucker's name, it's the same. And uh, that trip ticket number will follow the scale slip all down. Uh, getting a consensus on the various options of how to uh, keep track so fraud cannot occur uh, was a longer than hotly contested debate. It takes a lot of stakeholders. But that's why I keep going back to this this of operation and the uh, the Attorney General report on timber trust enforcement. It, 
implores them or requires them to look at any and all, including uh, enforcement uh, systems that have been in use in other abutting states and other parts of the Northeast uh, and report back. Are there any other, you mentioned one other state that, Maine, that has a, like a timber trespass? Uh, they do. But state of Maine has, they're called uh, state forests. They are uh, the state forest service. And uh, they require licenses. And these uh, foresters, you know, are carry firearms, have arrest authority, and a way another level of enforcement. There's not one or two to cover the state. Uh, they're everywhere. It's a big industry. And sure. uh, we financially, or just the, the structure of FPR is not, we are so far not there. We've got a lot of bureaucracy and we're not, there's a lot of pressure on state lands, how they're managed. To, to what interest groups, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And they are working hard and operating the numerous state parks and state forests, fanning them to. So they're not equipped at this time in history to move into that level of enforcement. Just that's the reality. Okay, a lot of responsibilities. Well, I think. <clears throat> I think we've got quite a lot of no. lifting to do to get this ready for fun times. Are there some loggers? We've got we've got some coming yeah. up uh, later. <clears throat> we wanted to get you folks in, you know, early on. That well, we could uh, I could but show we, you our witness list or tell you about it, but. Uh, well, there, we, there, we, there was a um, Orange County uh, logger uh, Lincoln on timber harvesting testified. Uh, yeah, we got anchors log. coming, and you know that's that's something that I hadn't even thought about. I mean, if you're a, a lending agency and you, know, you take a mortgage, somebody needs a bunch of money, so they mortgage a land and you know it's worth so much because of timber on it then a hijacker gets the timber and you're still using that land to support your mortgage and you lose right. that well you, you have quite a witness list yeah. here i'm familiar with virtually yeah. everyone on that list not to get a, all serious uh, professionals i would keep and you've got victims, you've got foresters, you've got bankers, you've got uh, you've got gr a great uh, bunch. Yeah. You've got commissioners. I would leave you with a simple idea that it's important, I think, for our industry and our forests that this does not die on the wall without any action. Uh, there are provisions, and I think you'll get testimony from these of all the stakeholders that are going to be on that uh, committee. Um, yeah, it can make this a, a more perfect bill, or certainly better. But uh, to do nothing is to be uh, very sad and to be negligent in moving forward. Yeah. Thank you, well, Chairman. If there are no other questions. I think it's got a lot of yeah, I'll touch it. Thank you. Thank you for getting that Thank over to us. And you also sent us a bunch of other stuff that would have been just as well if it stayed with you. <laughs> I, I rest my case. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff.